Uh, great. So I'm Amanda Doyle. I'm joined by Max and Damon, who are also going to be speaking with me uh, this afternoon uh, at different points in this presentation. So today we're going to talk about the housing database. There we go. Um, and we're going to talk about how we improved the volume production of a foundational data product and also talk about what this data product is. So first off, who are we? So we are the data engineering team at the Department of City Planning. We're relatively new. Uh, we're coming up on five years, which in city planning is uh, relatively new. And uh, we rethink, reimagine, and rebuild some of uh, DCP's core data products. Um, these data products include Pluto, Facilities Database, and the Capital Projects Database, some of our other data products that you may be familiar with. And what's really important to us is we make sure that what we do is open, transparent, and reproducible. So we like to kind of share our work with people like you. So what's our mission? Uh, we like to build high-quality public data sets. We like to build them in a transparent, automated man manner using open source technologies. That's really important to us. Our overhead is pretty low. Uh, besides our salaries, our operating costs is like $100 a month. Um, so proving that you can do, uh, you know, really great work in city government for, for the cheap. Um, we like to build an ecosystem around data. So with uh, documentation and metadata so that users can uh, effectively use our data products. And then we like to build a community around data. And this is why we come to events like this, to share what we do, uh, gain feedback from our users, and, uh, you know, get your input. So who are we? Um, we're a group of geographers, city enthusiasts, uh, statisticians, statisticians, sorry, hard word this morning or this afternoon, um, engineers, data enthusiasts, and uh, former consultants. Uh, so we're a small but mighty team, and we're hiring. So if you would like to join us, uh, please apply. And then just briefly, so what's the difference between a data engineer and a data analyst? So we consider ourselves engineers. We are like the foundation. Um, so we create data products. We try to, you know, get them into the best shape as possible before sending them to analysts who then do um, the research and analysis to then inform policy and make decisions. Um, we're not doing that work as engineers. So what do we do in a nutshell? So a lot of our work um, kind of boils down to this. Uh, we take tabular data, um, whether it is in Excel format and machine readable, which is lovely, um, or, you know, sometimes we have to scrape data from PDFs. Um, and then we uh, add spatial data to it so that it can be available on a map through an application to really help inform decisions. Because, you know, as uh, planners, we realize that uh, to make decisions, you really need to know where things are happening in time and space. And so that's the core of our work. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Damon to talk about how we build. Hello, everybody. And we are a new team, and I am a new member. I joined in January. I'm um, having a great time. I'm glad to be speaking to everyone today. So a little bit on how we build data sets, not just housing database in particular. Um, and like Amanda said, we are often using open source tools. But just in general, we're ingesting data, cleaning data, and then transforming it. And we have a few cooking analogies working here that you can surmise from the, from the emojis. Um, but with data ingestion, um, we are pulling in geospatial information. Um, we are standardizing addresses in the cleaning and transformation process and geocoding, which can mean a lot of different things. But generally, we're starting with text and trying to get coordinates um, but also especially trying to get uh, shapes. So whether it's polygons, lines, or points, um, we could say geocoding is going from information to a location um, and connecting information silos. So a lot of the data we're ingesting comes from many different agencies, many different sources, um, and hopefully is simple to join on one another, often is not. So um, a lot of the standardization is meant to be able to relate data sets to one another to then hand off as more informative uh, singular data sets um, and comprehensive documentation, which I think everyone who does this type of work will admit their documentation is never as comprehensive <laughs> as they'd like it to be. So we, we do our best. Um, so yeah, the cleaning and transformation and ingestion mm -hmm. are really the most, really the core of what we do. Uh, and so a little bit more on that, and I'll get more into the technologies we're using. Um, Postgres or Postgres SQL 
There's a flavor of SQL that we like to use. Um, Post GIS um, is just kind of a layer on top of PostgreSQL. And this is kind of our core form of database and how we store data. Of course, there are CSVs and shapefiles littered everywhere, but it's nice when you can get it into a database. Um, of course, GitHub, what we might call the recipe book. GitHub is how we store code, um, but it is also how we run code. So running code locally on your computer is great, but we're then limited by the resources and bandwidth of that actual computer. And we've become big fans of GitHub Actions, which I think in public free repos you have access to, I believe, which most of our repos are public. I mean, virtually all of them are. And GitHub Actions are really just a way for you to say, hey, cloud computing, run my code, and has been very, very helpful. Um, and then also more reproducible, and people have access to the same code and logs um, to run that code. So menagerie of technology here. Um, tried to organize it a bit from the bottom up. Like I mentioned, we have GitHub. We use Docker images, which is a way to containerize or say, hey, computer within a computer, isolate those tricky Python libraries so that I'm not messing up my entire setup. Um, so Docker is vital for our work. Um, DigitalOcean is for us in lieu of uh, AWS. So DigitalOcean is a way that we can store data, whether it's flat files or hosted databases, um, and sort of just working our way up. Bash, foundational way of writing code, but Python, very important to us too. Um, Mini, Min.io is a way to connect to um, DigitalOcean. So again, S3 um, saying, where are my files? Bring them in. Um, Min.io is just a great way to do that, especially in Bash. Um, like I mentioned, PostgreSQL, um, PostGIS, GDAL, foundational, open source, many different ways to use GDAL, whether it's within Python or within um, just command line Bash scripts. And then, of course, at the top, when you want to see things, we have the classic Jupyter Notebooks, um, Cardo, and Streamlit, which is a way that we can write pretty lightweight web applications in Python. And I think that is taking us to a generalization of our pipelines. Starting at the top left, we have DigitalOcean where we're storing data, um, whether it's from Department of Finance, sorry for the acronyms, but Department of Finance, Department of City Planning, our own data, or open data that we're ingesting and transforming to try and bring together in a more useful way. And then at the center of it, we often have a PostgreSQL database um, where we're doing the transformations in SQL. Um, and then it might eventually make its way to QAQC so that we can check our work and share that with other people um, in the department. And with or without GDAL, we can then export shapefiles, CSVs, and again, down to Streamlit as an example of how we might view our work. Um, that's a screenshot of one of our QAQC applications that we use internally to say, do the transformations we expect to happen actually happen and what are the results? And thankfully we can compare, say a data set we produced today to a data set we produced last year. And some differences are reasonable, some are unreasonable and might flag a bug. Um, and the arrow going back is not so much data moving back, but feedback into our process to say, okay, we pulled in the wrong data or the data we pulled in is just, you know, format we didn't expect it to be. Um, and then, of course, all of it um, going to uh, bytes of the Big Apple, in our case, for DCP, but open data more generally. Um, and we might call this our tech stack. And so just to highlight, DigitalOcean is where we are trying to snapshot a lot of open data or data from agencies that becomes open because we processed it and made it more standardized and, and usable um, for the general public. And that's it for our general stack. And back to Amanda for housing database. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. All right. So we're going to dive into the meat of this presentation. Um, if at any time while I'm going through this, if there are burning questions, uh, please raise your hand. Um, and we can kind of go through questions uh, as, we're, as we're diving in. So the housing database. So what is this data product? Um, a bunch of colorful dots on a map. Pretty colors. Uh, so just a bit of a teaser here, which we'll show again. Oh, that's the wrong link. Um, uh, which we'll refer back to later. So the housing database uh, shows uh, uses data from the Department of Buildings. 
and it shows new construction alterations that result in a change in the number of housing units or demolitions um, between 2010 and now. Um, so it's changed over time in basically the housing availability in New York City. And so uh, what's actually really interesting is you will really notice, you know, when a new building's coming down or when a new building's going up. Um, but then there are kind of like these sneaky alterations. So in this area right here, um, there are a lot of alterations going on that are, you know, either slightly modifying the number of units, which can really change the landscape of a neighborhood. And so that's one of the values um, for one of the use cases for the housing database here. So we'll get back to that a little bit more later. So let's dive in though. So again, what is this data product? So again, new buildings, demolitions, and alterations that add or remove residential units since 2010. So that change over time look is actually really important. So how has um, like the housing production changed year by year, or even month by month? So why is it important? The rent is too damn high. <laughs> Um, really, seriously, like it's, it's really going up here. Um, so this data product is really important for our planners to understand again, how housing has changed over the years and where it is changing to then inform policy to then, uh, you know, increase housing production where it's hosted. And that is like everywhere. So to really understand the housing database, it's important to understand how it's built. And, you know, all of our code is open because in our philosophy, um, if you're using a data product, it's really important to know how it's built. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about how it's built and then some of the enhancements that we made um, over the past couple of years to improve its quality. So first off, you kind of have to understand what goes into this data set. So what's going in to make the sausage? Um, most of the data comes from Department of Buildings. So if you're familiar with the Department of Buildings, Biz was like the old system. So if you wanted to go like look up a permit, you had to go to Biz. It's a little bit of a janky website. Um, and then they started to move over their data to what they call DOB now. Um, so now there are two systems. But the foundation, the foundational data sets come from Department of Buildings. Uh, some data sets uh, come from us at the Department of City Planning. And then a few um, a few data uh, fields are coming from the housing HPD, which I'm blanking on what that stands for, but Housing New York, which is affordable housing units. Um, so input data sets. So first we have a DOB job application filings, and this is coming from Biz. So this is the former system, um, which has been around uh, for many years. And so in short, um, this is every single job application. And by definition, uh, job applications are overall plans filed with the Department of Buildings outlining development changes and alterations within a property. And so for us, like one record is a job um, in this data set. And then uh, DOB came out with DOB Now. And this was an enhancement uh, because they came up with a new data system and as a result, a new schema. Um, and so while this uh, little bit of a project of incorporating a new source data set should have been uh, maybe uh, simpler, uh, it was not. Um, so we had to figure out how to ingest data from a new data source. We had to then map these new fields into the uh, housing database, which was an established data product because you're we built this thing just using biz data. Um, we released it a couple of years ago for public consumption. And then soon after we released it for public consumption, DOB came out with DOB Now. So we had to like ingest this new data. Um, and then we had to normalize these new values to existing values. Um, so huge thanks to DOB for collaborating on this because this really was a back and forth effort of uh, trying to understand how the DOB records really fit into biz and then subsequently into the housing database. And so what's on um, for public consumption now does include data from biz and DOB now. And that's important because all job applications that result in a new building demolition or alteration are now being filed in the new system. So we need to get in that data set. So the next data set that we pull in is the permits data. 
And so by definition, permits are issued by DOB in response to a job, job application, granting permission to perform the specific work. So again, this is a different table, but it's really important to know, you know, okay, yes, someone filed an application, but actually is it moving forward? So we need to pull in this data set. And then lastly, we're pulling in certificate of occupancy data. And there's a little asterisk here. So we're there. this data is available on open data, but a key data point was missing for us. Um, so what is not on open data is how many uh, units are permitted with each certificate of occupancy. So if you're building a really big building and say you have 500 units, um, you can get certificates of occupancy for like, for example, 100 units at a time. So you say, okay, in April, you finished 100 units, you can occupy 100 units. And then that kind of goes on a rolling basis until your construction's finished. So for us, it was important to know how many residential units are coming online or, be, or able to be occupied um, kind of incrementally and not all at once. So we're asking GOB to get that information on open data. Uh, it's still a work in progress. Um, so yeah, so that's the input data. I guess any questions on the input data? So we're pulling in all these data sets uh, to then create uh, the singular product and housing database um, so that you can really understand how all these data sets work together and then um, you know could use it for analysis. So some of the value that we add for these input data sets is not just combining them together, but normalizing and simplifying the attributes. Um, one of the things that we want to kind of help users is not on, is not have to speak DOB speak. Um, so to really simplify the, the values that are um, in this data product. So first off, we also just select a subset of the data. So if you're looking at the DOB job applications data, you'll see job applications, not just for, you know, construction for housing units, but you might see plumbing, electrical, uh, elevators, kind of the whole gamut. So we like to simplify that down and just select a subset of the input data that impacts the number of residential units. Um, and then we make values more friendly for the average user. So for example, um, you as a user do not need to know what A-1 means <laughs> or actually look that up. So at, in the database, it'll say A-1 equals assembly, theaters and churches. Um, so we translate those occupancy codes. And then also we add new fields. So where we compute the values from the input data. And so we have these categories to say, okay, is a job filed? Is it um, permitted? Is it completed? And those are all um, computed based on these various dates that come from Department of Buildings. And so they'll say, you know, date filed, um, you know, is X. And then we'll say, okay, it's, it's filed or, you know, date complete is not null. Um, we'll say that it's completed construction. Uh, we worked very closely with our housing team at the Department of City Planning to work on these categories, but really just to make it more intuitive so that you're not looking across many fields to understand where a job application is in its process. You can just look at one and say, okay, here are all the jobs that are complete. Um, in a certain period of time. And then we join data from other tables. So, you know, as our input data sets, we had many, we had these kind of four core input tables. So we're mapping data from um, Department of Building Certificate of Occupancy so that you know, like how many um, units uh, have been approved to be occupied. So, cause there can be a difference between what a uh, applicant requested their a number of units to be versus how many you know, actually could be occupied. And then we're also joining on data from other data sources. So for here, for example, we're joining uh, in the second screenshot, data from Pluto, which is one of our other data products. Um, and this is an example of, you know, what uh, data sets are in the flood zone, or sorry, what records are in the flood zone, um, which might be important to know. And then uh, and another enhancement we made was to facilitate the joins with other tables um, recently. So this is, uh, joining with the Housing New York data. And so Housing New York is a really valuable data set for our uh, researchers because it um, it's really useful to understand affordability with housing. But the way that the data is um, uh, 
is stored is it's not a one-to-many relationship and it's not just a simple join between DRB data and, and Housing New York data. So we had to get a little creative and we worked with our housing team to you know try to figure out, okay, how do you map a DOB record to a Housing New York record? And so there are many different ways, but you ultimately end up with one-to-many, many-to-one, and many-to-many joins um, between the housing database and the Housing New York data. Uh, but this effort was really important to support affordable housing research within New York City. This is another enhancement that we made. So when we get the data from Department of Buildings, it is all tabular. And like, that's not you know, the most exciting way to view it. Um, it's not really the most intuitive way to view it. So we map individual jobs, um, you know, using kind of a variety of techniques to get the most accurate location possible. And then once we have it mapped, we then assign all those geospatial attributes. So whether it's the census tract, uh, the council district, the neighborhood tabulation area, uh, because that's really useful because you want to know, okay, if you want to do some analysis later, like how many units um, are coming online within a certain neighborhood, you can now do that. Uh, and so to say the least, sometimes DOB, DOB data is messy. Um, and so we systematically correct records. And so what this screenshot is showing is that if the job is a new building, set the number of existing dwelling units to zero. Uh, you, it does, a new building, it does not exist. It should not have more than zero units. It should not have more than zero units. Um, and so we go ahead and set that. We also do the same for a demolition. If you're bringing down a building, the proposed number of units is also zero. Um, that's not always true on the source data. So we just like to do some systematic cleaning here. And then we cannot... Uh, clean everything systematically. The data is just a little messy. So we output records for review by our housing team. So this is a very large QAQC report that we designed with the housing team. They find this really useful, um, but it's basically saying, you know, what are the qualities of an individual record that you need to research? And so then they go and do a huge effort to manually research um, these records that need review and then add value to it. And that's one of the, um, I would say, probably one of the uh, biggest value adds of this data set. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Max to then talk more about the quality assurance and quality control. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Max, one of the data engineers of the Department of City Planning. And here to talk about the quality assurance and quality control checks that we do for the housing database. So one of the uh, biggest enhancements that we kind of undertook uh, this past fall uh, was to update our QAQC reports and also improve our data viz graphs in our Streamwood app. Um, this is um, a, a graph of the job status distribution. Uh, we basically use these uh, these graphs um, to to check our data um, to see if we have expected results um, to see if. Uh, from version to version, we don't have any like crazy outliers. Um, so this is one of the uh, the checks that we do in the uh, in the street. What happened? Um, this is another one that we do. Um, this is a geography check, which is really important uh, for us. Um, and some of the things that it's highlighting here is so these. This is a, an internal uh, streamlit app that we use for QAQC. Uh, but some of the things doing here is it's checking uh, these geo water. Um, so geo water for us is a geography that falls within the water. Um, obviously, that's not great um, because a building shouldn't be built in the water. Um, so uh, we, we, we decided, and kind of this is a uh, back and forth with the housing team, because uh, it actually knows that we had records uh, that were fall falling in the water. Uh, and, you know, they wanted to know why that was happening. Um, so there's a number of reasons why that could happen. Um, the two main ones are uh, we actually geocode, as Amanda had mentioned, we geocode our records. Um, and sometimes the geocoding is off. Um, the other reason is that there can also be a projection issue uh, with one of our, our source data inputs. Um, so that was one of the checks that we added. Um, then we also have, uh, you can see here, the uh, the versions are on the bottom. Uh, so we've, we've vastly improved. Um, the number of records. I mean, it wasn't too many. I think there's there's only a, a couple hundred, but um, 
And then we also have the uh, the geotax lot. And so that's um, obviously really important. Every record in um, the housing database should have a BBL or a, a borough block and lot, which is the unique identifier for um, a property within New York City. Um, so we want to try to keep those minimized as much as possible. So we really tried to improve our QA, QC checks so that a lot of the upfront work was tough. Uh, and so we don't have to ride almost solely on the housing team for our QA, QC checks. Um, so Amanda kind of mentioned this, this manual research process that, um, that is done. And this is in collaboration with our, with our housing team, which are, you know, the, the, the experts, um, of the, the data set. We're the builders and they are the experts. Um, so there's a pretty robust, uh, manual research process that they go through. Um, and there's the, um, a lot of the corrections that are made within the manual research are pretty much solely dedicated to units. I wouldn't say solely, but a lot of them are dedicated to units. I mean, units is the reason why we build the housing database. Um, it's what everyone wants to know, uh, is how many units are being built in a certain geographic area. Um, so we have, um, they go through that process. Um, they, we have essentially like a CSV, um, where, and this is kind of a, a snapshot of it right here where it takes the job number. Um, you know, it says the class A init. So the class A init is a uh, class A is a, uh, a type of residential unit. Um, and init stands for initial. Uh, so that's the initial, um, class A units that they're proposing in the project. Um, and they'll say, they'll go through and, you know, they'll take a look on Google to see, if, you know, whether or not the process uh, or the building has been finished. Um, and they'll go through the certificate of occupancy data. Uh, so they really go through with a, with a, a fine comb to figure out maybe the certificate of occupancy was wrong, or maybe like Amanda had said, uh, their initial certificate of occupancy said a hundred, but then there were two more. Uh, and so it really should be 300. Um, so there's also, uh, some other uh, unit counts that we, we produce with the housing database. Um, we take a look at, um, hotels. Um, this is, uh, one of the, uh, columns that we produce. Um, we also have this other B, um, and other B are, uh, dormitories, assisted living, uh, supportive housing. Uh, so kind of everything that doesn't, that falls outside of the scope of hotel or like a classic residential unit. Uh, and then. We put it all together. Again, this is the dot map that we all saw earlier. Um, and this is, uh, I think Amanda will also show you this a little bit, uh, but this is kind of like a zoomed in version of the uh, Capital Planning Explorer in the housing database. Um, so this is kind of what it shows. And you see you have an initial number of units of zero. Um, the proposed units was 275, and then the net change of that uh, particular uh, building or property um, added was, was 275. Um, so we, in our, we output, um, all of our, the housing database to, to bytes of the big apple. And then it also goes on open data. Um, one of the, the key things we kind of do a lot of the hard work, uh, for, for analysis, um, is that we create these unit change summary files. Um, so we have the aggregate totals for the number of housing units, uh, produced. Um, in different and varying geographic areas, we have the, the census block, uh, the census tracts, the community district, council districts, uh, MTA, which is the neighborhood tabulation era, uh, area, and then, uh, Puma, which is the, that one's going to get mixed. Um, but, um, so this is, um, this map I made in about, I don't know, maybe two minutes. Um, and it's, but it's basically using our aggregated uh, files that you can get directly as a shape file or as a CSV. Um, and I brought it into Cardo. And as you can see, uh, this is the, uh, units completed by community district in 2022. Um, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, you know, uh, Northern Brooklyn uh, and, and Western Queens are like, have, you know, a pretty serious amount of um, the number of completed units. Um, and this, uh, these processes and this QA, QC reports that we, uh, that we generate are really, really important to us, obviously, because we want to produce the highest quality data that we can. Um, and then it's really important to our planners. Uh, you know, they want to make data driven decisions. Um, and quality data is how they make those correct and data driven decisions. Um, so with that, I think I will pass it back to a minute. Awesome. Thanks, Lex. 
All right, so I'm going to bring us home, um, and we're going to have plenty of time for questions and discussion. So housing DB for you. So the code is open. So this is really important to us again, like I said. Um, when I started the data engineering team about five years ago, there was this initiative for open algorithms. So if you were uh, using an algorithm to inform decisions that affected New Yorkers, your code had to be open. And I said, well, we may as well apply the same for data. So if you're using a data product, um, you can really see, if you're using one of our data products, uh, you can see how that data set is created, which I think is important because, you know, to uh, understand the data, you need to know how it's created, where it's coming from, what are its limitations. And so uh, we have a, you know, GitHub organization, New York City Planning, and then we have all of our repos, um, which are open for public consumption. So now you're like, okay, guys, you presented on this data. Like, how can I use it? Um, so it's available on Bytes of the Big Apple. You can also find it on New York City Open Data. Uh, but New York City Open Data just loops back to Bytes of the Big Apple. Um, they're like, you guys host it yourselves. Um, so you can uh, find it through New York City Open Data and Bytes of the Big Apple. Again, you can download the uh, record by record uh, files, which is, you know, each job application from 2010 to present. Uh, but then as Max presented, you can download those unit change summary files. So, you know, you may be the user who's like, I don't really care about every single, um, you know, job application. I just want to know how many units have been added or removed by a specific geographic area. And so you don't have to do that data manipulation yourself. You can just download that shapefile or CSV, pop it into your you know, GIS software of choice and do that mapping yourself. And then what can you do with it? So you can do a lot. Um, the top three things that we got from our housing team that they were like, this is you know, what you can do with it, is analyze the change in new residential units over time by geographic area. It's probably like the most foundational way to use this. Um, study how the number of residential units may grow in the future. So kind of looping back to what this is. Um, so a job application is, you know, a developer is asking to build something. That doesn't mean that it's built. And so, you know, they may have filed something in 2022 for 500 units in a specific area, but that construction may not be completed for three, five, seven years, depending on their project. So it's not just 20, it's not just uh, residential units from 2010 to now that have kind of are able to be occupied. It's what may come. Um, and that's really important because it's, well, where are people going to live? And then where do we need to plan for more schools, bigger sewers, more infrastructure, more parks? Um, and so that is a huge use case um, for this data set is not just what's now, but what is in the future. And then uh, we can also examine the characteristics of new buildings, demolitions, and alterations, such as number of units and completion time. And so, you know, with this data set, you can see when a job was filed and then when a job was completed. And so how quickly is construction happening in the city? Um, so, you know, there are definitely points in time, whether it was a pandemic or a recession or some other uh, event where construction really slowed down. And so your average construction time of, OK, a, a job was filed, typically, depending on the size of the building, maybe that takes three years from application filed to your final certificate of occupancy being issued because construction was moving very quickly. But depending on different points in time, that really slowed down. And so now you have to really adjust to, well, if someone is asking to build a building, when could I expect those units to be complete, which would then inform how I plan uh, for change within that neighborhood? So that's it. Um, so we flew through that. Uh, I'm sorry, everybody. But we have plenty of time for questions, discussion. Um, you know, we're here. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much for your work. I'm a big fan. And awesome. I like what you pulled it from media, explaining some of the things here. But um, my question uh, was, how do you see these data products being used to push the needle toward building more affordable housing? Oh, 
I have someone from the housing team here. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so if you find Winnie, um, who's from city planning, definitely ask her this question to you. I'm going to, I realize I need to repeat the question just for the Zoom people. Um, so the question was, um, how do we see this data set, um, kind of pushing the needle to add more affordable housing? So for, so for department and buildings data, so it's, it's not inherently affordable, but by tying it into the housing New York data, that's where we're trying to understand, okay, um, what, how many of these units are affordable? Um, and I think then by, you know, saying, okay, this is where affordable units are being built, which are definitely concentrated in a few neighborhoods, then policy can maybe start to broaden where um, where we're kind of facilitating affordable housing. And then I know that um, there have been some incentives that have kind of sunsetted recently. Um, I'm blanking exactly on what those codes are, if anyone knows what programs I'm talking about. The 421A. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, we're going to see like in this data what the impact of that is. And then to say, okay, well, without that, then, you know, what does the affordable housing landscape look like? And then to hopefully really justify bringing it back or something similar or better. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to take the front and then back. Uh, do you know who is using this data now? In the city? Uh, not everybody. Well, <laughs> not, we don't know everybody who's using it. So if you are, like, you know, raise your hand and give us a shout. Oh, they're awesome. Yeah, we got some users here. That's great. Um, so, so no, we don't know all our users. Um, but this is why we come out and we like to, to meet you. Um, so we, when we built this data product, it was really only for internal use. Um, and so it was really focused on planners within city planning to, um, to then collaborate with other city agencies to say, hey, there are going to be a lot of new people coming to this neighborhood. Parks department, maybe you want to build a better park or bigger park, or uh, Department of um, Environmental Protection, you may need to increase your sewer size um, to uh, accommodate the more residential units that are coming online. Um, but yeah, we want to know, since we made this public, I think two years ago now, you know, who is using it? What are you using it for? And like, if you want to kind of give a shout out uh, for those who are using it, what are you guys using it for? There's a book in public library. Um, like, oh. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, and I uh, we use it for uh, geocoding uh, okay. or just to see kind of where it runs uh, across the borough and across the city. Um, and, you know, what their major characteristics are of that. Awesome. You read a couple of one, one around someone else want to give a shout out? Come on, try to take it. It's uh, we, uh, uh, we're, we do augmented reality for future built environment. Uh, so uh, we look at the, the output of a part of that for saying what's being built where. Awesome. Cool. Um, I know you had a question. Yeah, it's kind of set up for some of your response uh, to the question, which is how uh, can you set that up? planning looks at some of this data and then flags to other departments, you know, when they should pay attention to something. But have there been, and what have been the most frequent uh, cases of uh, other departments uh, looking and using your tool proactively and then coming to you or expressing interest in it? Uh, like, what are the departments that are not to understand within the city? Got it. So, um, all right. So, as the Department of City Planning, we have a carrot and not a stick um, because we are not a capital agency. And so we don't really have funding as many of the capital agencies do. So for a very long time, I would say that the Department of City Planning hasn't really been involved in the capital planning until a few years ago when the Neighborhood Development Fund came to fruition, which was um, a fund that was set up to say, OK, for these neighborhoods that are being rezoned, we're going to collaborate with these big agencies to say, okay, we need to build that bigger sewers, uh, parks, and, and so forth. Um, but I, I can't say that it, from my experience or perspective, um, 
that that hasn't been long going. Um, but there are a few agencies that really do rely on this data and um, collaborate closely with teams within the Department of City Planning. The one that's top of mind is the School Construction Authority. And so they we create um, kind of a, a souped up version of this for them. So Department of Buildings data you know, only goes out so far. And then we work with planners to get some hypotheticals of, okay, where are we thinking rezoning is going to happen um, in the next five to 10 years to give a little further outlook to then plan schools? Uh, because, you know, it does take a long time to build a new school, add school seats to a school. And so school construction authority really does rely on working with our housing team and our capital planning team to use this data to then say, ah, yes, this neighborhood, we're going to need to add, um, well, depending on the borough, uh, you know, 100 school seats or, or something like that uh, for the number of housing units. Yeah. Sort of related to what you were just talking about, I'm wondering if there's been any discussion about Getting into the buildings and how you might represent the unit mix of different buildings, particularly mm -hmm. multifamily. I bring it up because yeah. I work a lot with DOE yeah. and other school districts. And there you really want to understand what type of housing results in how many children. That's going to depend on whether it's family friendly, like three bedroom. Um, so these kinds of like getting into the building. Yeah. Um, so there's no, so we don't have that exact information of, um, you know, if a building is being built, what's the mix of one bedroom studio, two bedrooms, three, build, three bedrooms. The best that we can do right now is to take the square footage and then take the number of units and then do some rough math to say on average, a two bedroom is you know, X number of square feet. Um, but obviously that can vary if you have like this big loft um, somewhere in Brooklyn, that might throw things off. But for um, school kind of seat analysis, I would say about, I don't know, three to five years ago, there was a big effort to change the multipliers. So to do kind of school seat projection of if I, if I build a housing unit, how many children may that generate? Um, it used to be kind of a borough level multiplier to say if I was building one housing unit in Queens, um, it re would result in I don't know, 0 0.3 children. But if I was building a housing unit in Manhattan, it would result in 0 0.1 children. There's a lot of diversity within neighborhoods, um, within boroughs. And so there was a really extensive effort done by our population team um, our housing team and other research units within the Department of City Planning to bring that down to a neighborhood level. So to the neighborhood tabulation area to say, well, if I'm building a neighborhood in um, the Upper West Side, or if I'm building a unit in the Upper West Side and it results in 0 0.2, but if I'm building a unit in the East Village, maybe it results in 0 0.05 children. Um, just to kind of add that layer of nuance. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Back. So, so you talked about posting your data that goes into the build process on digital ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the response is open to this cafe to, to dive into it. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. Check it out. Uh, Heroic data engineering. Um, but it's, if someone wants to read those that mm -hmm. have build process, because the data sources are platform. Uh, yeah, I get to my question is, is there at some point in the future going to be a way where folks to like actually rebuild that repository themselves and run it from themselves? That would be awesome. Um, and I think that's actually do where we want to go. So some of these, so for housing database, um, some of the data sets are hosted in a private area in digital ocean. Um, because we get them right from the Department of Buildings and not all the fields that they give us are for public consumption. So yeah, we could clean them up and limit the number of fields and move them into 
kind of a public area on DigitalOcean. And then, yeah, so since our public area on DigitalOcean is available for everybody, um, you could then go in and, right, and, and build everything yourself. Um, there are certainly a couple of our other data products. I think like the facilities database, which is another data set, that is a good example where all the sourcing is um, in kind of a, a public space. Um, and so that actually is something we've been wanting to do for a while is to help people just fill their data sets themselves. So we should uh, put some documentation around that to say, this is how you do that. Yeah. Well, yeah, one of my questions would be like, would you consider publishing just like a dump for post stuff and maybe it's been just entirely? Yep, I'm getting nods, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Oh, cool. So I'm wondering, uh, with all these data issues that you're identifying and the sources that you're using, can you talk to the provider of that data set about like, putting your inputs? This is an ongoing issue. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so not, not kind of like finger pointing to DOB. It, it's pervasive, right? So we get data from Department of Buildings. We get data from Department of Finance for Pluto. Um, what we've noticed is, and your kind of theme is every agency has their own business need for their data. And so like, they create data for their own business use case. As long as it's good enough for their business use case, fine. They're like, we're good. It, it works for us. Um, so if we're making a request to improve the data quality and it doesn't impact their business need, I can't say that there's a very strong response to then go back and correct that data. Um, and that's just, I think, not just citywide, I think that's the kind of the nature of data that people are producing. Um, so we would like to get to a place with all, you know, so that we have that relationship with all the agencies that we ingest data from to create that feedback loop to improve the data quality. Um, so where we are right now is we inform um, many of our data providers, but we accept that to meet our business needs, we're going to need to rely on ourselves to do that data cleaning. Yeah. Hi, uh, can I ask you to talk a little bit more in the weeds about how you do the geocoding and then what sort of tests you set out to the cloud? Sure. Um, let me see if I can get back to you. So like, I, even like sort of how you interact with like with the geo support. <laughs> All right, yeah, so geo support. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, geo support is New York City Planning's geocoding software. Um, New York City addresses are very funny. Um, I grew up in Queens and I thought every single address had a dash until I went to college. But yeah, um, <laughs> rude awakening. So, so there's a few ways that we can get the geometry. And so for geo support, um, basically an address has to exist for it to be in geo support. And so the geographic research unit and the Department of City Planning is constantly working with Department of Buildings, with uh, the um, borough presidents, um, with developers to add family addresses, add new addresses to get it into geo support so that we can then like geocode addresses. And the benefit of geo support over like Google Maps, for example, is Google Maps, if you put in an address, it'll say like, in, in, say that address does not exist. Um, say it's like 100 court square. It's like, does not exist. It'll say, okay, but it, if it did exist, it, it would be here. Um, geo support will say, no, this does not exist. It's out of bounds. Like, just, it, it's not a real address. Um, so that's one of the benefits of geo support. Um, and so, we'll take the address from the Department of Buildings and run it through Geosport and like see what we get. So like if the building is done, it should be in there and then we would get the most accurate location. Um, but if it's not in there, then we kind of go through a rigmarole to say, okay, you know, where can we get this point from? 
Um, and so we kind of have a hierarchy here. I don't remember this off the top of my head, so bear with me. So, well, we could take it from the uh, building footprint layer. So if, say, for example, they're, uh, they're demoing a building. And so they're saying, we're demoing this building. Here's the building identification number. We can then join that onto uh, the do it building footprint to say, okay, you're taking down this building. Um, and then we could, there is, um, and then we could take also the quite information from the borough block and lot, so the BDL, so the tax lot. So when they, they are filing number, they'll say, well, okay, it's going on this lot. Um, and so we could geo, we could take the such right of that lot. The thing is, is like lots change. So like if people are building a building and saying they're, you know, merging lots or, or segmenting lots, like, um, that's just not preferred to use that, but we, our goal is to get the point as close to on the building as possible, um, and not in the water as an exception. Yeah. Enough? Yeah. Um, I don't want to. No, no, no. I think I think we're going to be about eight minutes left. So okay. I was wondering, like, um, tracking net units, mm -hmm. like it nets out because you go from demolish to then done zero units. Yeah. And HL day. I'm wondering if you've given any thought to how we can link across that intermediate step. If you might be interested in there was six homes here, they're all single family. They've emerged into this unit and want to trap in the first form all the way to the development. Don't really bear the okay with big effort a bit in between. Yeah. So our housing team actually is doing that. Um so we do output a report that says, okay, here's here's a demolition and then here's a new building and those locations intersect. And so these two are probably related. Um, we don't output that for public consumption because it's only for internal research right now, but I'm actually curious, what would the use case be? Because that might inform, you know, maybe we, we do put out that cross, put out that crosswalk. Yeah. Maybe just general interesting parts, but then like just being able to understand the history and the law of the time. And yeah, that to not have to make like a couple of queries to go to. You have to ask for and now it's but just the I'm supportive for putting out that crosswalk. Yeah, if we can do that. And there's a question in the back. Uh, yeah. So my question here is, do you track uh, the number of last minutes of life? Not in this data set. Um, and I don't know if as an agency we do. Um, so this data set is is tracking um, residential units that are that are being added or taken away. Um, but right, we're not tracking whether any of the units that are being taken away have been rent stabilized. And any like the four twenty one A, you're tracking people housing. So. Right. Okay. Only oh, that's very new. Well, no, I guess. To a large, I it would be very. I I hundred percent agree. Yeah. So so yes. Not I don't have a good answer for that. So not in this data set. Um, we're we're not tracking that. Um, but I want to ask Winnie if there's a resource for you. Yeah. I mean, I I'm just also wondering, like, is that data available? I know a lot of people want this data <laughs> um, and I've had a lot of people ask, you know, how, because I guess like there's, there are a lot of definitions um, or a lot of different types of affordable housing units. So like rent stabilized and 421A and then like there's, um, I don't know, Mitchell Lama. Like, so there's this whole landscape of affordable units within New York City. And from my knowledge, they're all basically like different data sets. Um, and so I, I don't know if there's a single resource, um, to, to understand what that landscape is. Well, uh, maybe 
anything, but I do know that there is a website available that helps to keep the audience specific property. Uh, you know, like the number of rents they was. It's, uh, it's a little tough of rent stabilized units because the landlord, I think, has to report the rent stabilized units and they don't have to report them. Mm-hmm. Or a yeah, report lags like two or three years or something like that. So it's not like the most robust. Um, but I think it gives you like a good help. You know, like, yeah. for example, my adopted partner in the home didn't know that when it went live until we were renewing the lease. So I'm familiar with one of those times. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to go to her first. Uh, and him saying about affordable housing and then that you didn't have, so well, then you wear is that how do you break it down in different ways? You know, affordable levels or something like that. Do you know more about this? More about building? Yeah. 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 Y